Hello, Foothills family. Today, we're in the book of James. And James chapter 2 is very practical and easily applies to each of our lives. Now, this chapter breaks up into two equal sections. The first 13 verses teach us about right and wrong motives. And then the last 13 verses talk about the nature of true faith. These are both very important topics for us. Now, it begins by pointing out wrong motives. I'm going to read the first four verses. Brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and you say, here, you sit here in the good place. And then you say to the poor man, you stand over there in the corner or sit down by my footstool. Have you then not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Now, it teaches us that we must be careful not to show favoritism. We are not to favor those who have wealth or who are especially successful by worldly standards or those who are more attractive in appearance or dress. When we do this, it's often in the hope that we might receive some benefit for ourselves or our church, perhaps a financial one, or maybe gain higher status. But favoritism and the gospel don't go together. Jesus didn't offer us salvation on the basis of what we could offer Him. Romans chapter 5 makes this very clear. It tells us in verse 6 that Christ died for us while we were helpless. And then in verse 8, it says He died for us while we were still sinners. And then in verse 10, it goes so far as to say He died for us while we were His enemies. So there's no place for selfish motives in how we treat people who come to church. We are to love and serve everyone just as Christ did, without consideration of any personal benefit. We need to step out of our comfortable cliques and offer love and friendship to those who come among us. You know, many people leave a church and never come back because no one stepped out from their comfortable clique and showed them love or friendship. May I ask you, how are you doing in this regard? Also, when we show favoritism, it often means that we are operating on the world's value system and not God's. Let me read verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? God's values are upside down from the world's. God often chooses those who are poor and humble in the world's eyes. And very often it is those who are rich and powerful and famous who reject Christ Jesus and fail to enter into His kingdom. God's values and the world's values will seldom agree. Listen to this. Jesus said in Luke 16, 15, that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Wow. That's quite a statement. The church becomes weak and spiritually empty when we let worldly standards enter the church. Now, on the other hand, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 40, that when we welcome and serve the stranger or the one who is in need, we are serving Christ. And when we do this, Jesus says, He is in our midst and He will reward us. Now, that's the secret to being a great church. Now, we've been looking at wrong motives, and here in verse 8, He tells us what the right motive is. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, then you are doing well. We should live out of love. Love is always to be our motive. You know, in verses 9 through 11, James points out that favoritism is a sin as much as adultery is a sin. And then in verse 12, he tells us that we need to follow the law of liberty. We do this when we live empowered and directed by the Holy Spirit, rather than being directed by self-interest and selfish desires. That's the law of liberty. And in this way, we will always live out God's love. Now, beginning with verse 14, we enter the second section of this chapter, the section on the true nature of faith. Let me read the 14th verse. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith 
but he has no works. Can that faith save him? At first glance, some might think this is a contradiction of Paul's teaching, that we are saved by faith alone, apart from any works. But this misunderstands both Paul and James and their teaching. And in fact, some do today take parts of Paul's teaching out of context and incorrectly interpret them to support their wrong views on grace. They teach that sin doesn't really matter and that God's grace gives us a sort of a license to sin. It's not surprising that they twist Paul's teaching. People have done that ever since Paul wrote his epistles. The Apostle Paul, excuse me, the Apostle Peter, who of course wrote during Paul's lifetime, wrote this in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. It says, um, But regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just also as our beloved Paul wrote, according to the wisdom given to him as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things in which are some things that are hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. And so people are already perverting Paul's teaching. In fact, even Paul himself had to address those who were twisting his teaching in Romans 3.8. You can check it out later. Now, James and Paul are teaching against two different errors. Paul is teaching against the error of legalism, and James is teaching against the opposite error of lawlessness. One error teaches that we can save ourselves by our good works, and the opposite teaches that since we are not saved by our works, but by grace alone, that it doesn't matter how we live. Now, clearly, both of these are errors. Paul's teaching is like one bank of a river, and James is like the opposite bank in a river. You need both banks for the river to flow. The river flows between those two truths. Take away even one of those banks, and you'd no longer have a river. You'd have a swamp. Martin Luther blended Jesus, James, excuse me, Martin Luther blended James and Paul's teaching in this way. He said, we are saved by grace alone, but not by a grace that is alone. In other words, true grace that saves us always brings forth works of grace. Saving faith that comes to us as a gift of God always produces faithfulness in us. In verse 17, James says that faith is not, that is not accompanied by works is dead faith. In verse 26, he says it's like a corpse that has no breath or spirit in it. And in verse 19, he says that that kind of faith is no different from the awareness that even demons have, namely that there is only one God. Now that alone, that knowledge alone brings the demons no benefit, it only makes them tremble. This chapter underscores the fact that acts of faith are the only proof that someone has true faith. Unfaithful living, on the other hand, is proof that a person does not have true faith nor the grace of God. Understanding true faith and knowing what right motives are both essential keys for living the Christian life. And this chapter helps us to grasp them both. Have a great day.